It's good to be back. <laughs> Again. Um, back, yeah, 26 Leak Street. This place, this building, was a place I used to frequent quite a lot in my younger years. Um, it was a boogie place, a place to dance and party. And I was talking to some of the security guards, and they said it's still the same thing. So I might be back here on Saturday. Anyway, you don't pick your role models, they pick you. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is my journey and how role models have shaped my life, influenced my life, and maybe have influenced some of your lives. And probably not my role models, but your own role models. But I'm going to start with um, my journey in terms of my home and how I grew up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, are we all familiar with that film, Home Alone? Yeah, great film. And kind of meant a lot to me growing up. So I'm just going to give you a bit of history. So my mother and father, both Nigerian, came to this country 64, 66, respectively, um, as immigrants. And we, me and my two sisters, one of my sisters is here, by the way. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a name check. Um, we were born to her. So I was born in 68. And in that time, it was you know, difficult for them to do what they wanted to do, how they wanted to do it. But what they did impose on us or instill in us was the idea of education and making yourself the best that you can be. So that was really interesting. So 10 years in, so they probably 64, 62, my mum and dad bought their first house in 72. And around 79, my dad decided, yep, I've had enough of London, England. I've learned a lot. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go and set up my own businesses in Nigeria. And he's going to take all of us with him. I was 10 years of age, and I said, don't think so, mate. Ain't happening. I want to stay here. I obviously didn't use that language, but, you know, whatever I did say. And they agreed somehow. They agreed to let me stay in London on my own. Now, yeah, let's go for it, I said. But I wasn't really on my own. I stayed in a family house, which is still our house today, uh, where my mother stays. And in the house were what I thought my uncles and aunts extended family. Years later, it found out to be they were students paying my mum and dad rent and keeping an eye on me. That would make sense to you a bit later. But I had my own bedroom, my own front room. But before then, I'd say between four and 10, my mother and father instilled in me a level of discipline that you probably might not recognize from Nigerian familyhoods. I probably knew how to cook, bathe, clothe, sweep the floor, do all the domestics to the nth degree by the time I was five or six. My mum and dad each had four or five jobs each, which meant that they were out a lot. From six in the morning till eight, nine, at 10 at night. They would come back in to make sure that the food was there, we eat it, we went to bed, but we were home alone most often. So I think when they made a decision or agreed for me to stay on my own, it wasn't too hard for them to do so. So you're thinking, what does that mean, staying on your own at the age of 10 in 1979? South London, which is where I was born and bred, Brixton, actually. And that's going to be important to the story, just because I wasn't the only home aloner. There are many other home aloners within our community who were, for whatever reason, left to, to their own devices. But I wasn't really left to my own devices. As I said, there's some people in the house, and they were the type of people that chose me to instill with on me what they considered to be their vision, their values, which were important for me to be growing, for growing up with. So what does that mean in essence? And I don't know all the details, but I'm gonna share with you some of the stories, is that, as I said, growing up, my mum would take me to Brixton Market, would take me to the various shops to buy our food and our product, produce. And from about 11, I used to meet a particular woman outside what is now called Kentucky Fried Chicken, but it wasn't back in those days. And that's an interesting story in itself. And she would give me 20 pounds. And with that 20 pounds, I'd go into the market, cornflakes, custard creams, my favorite, a chicken, bits of meat, some tomato, some oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was my staple diet for the week. What was interesting, though, is the shopkeepers would always wonder, was I there on the Friday, or the following Friday, or the Friday after that? And if I wasn't, would put out a feeler to that community, where's Bayo? Where's Ade? Where's this? Where's that? Because they knew that we weren't necessarily doing the things in a way that other families and other people were doing. So they were looking out for us. And they would be talking to us about, how are you cooking that? What oil are you using? What spices are you using? How long is that rice going to boil for? 
I noticed you didn't buy this last week, you didn't buy that the week before. I didn't think much of it, I just thought they were being nosy or just wanted to know where I was cooking well. But in hindsight, what they were trying to instill with me was, we got your back, mate. And so therefore, we're gonna hopefully shape how and what you're doing moving forward. So that was the easy stuff, buying stuff in the market, bringing it back home. But in terms of my own personal development and growing up, I had to rely on other people. So in the household, as I said, with some students, they were probably in their 20s, latest 24, 25. They were West African. They were from all walks of life, doing all types of study. And there was me, going to school at 8.30, coming back about 6, should have been 4.30, but you know how it is, coming home, and they were wondering, hmm, is he eating well? Is he sleeping well? And they became my role models as well in terms of behavior, in terms of understanding our community, what it meant to be a West African. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't live completely on my own and never saw my mum and sisters. Every Christmas, every summer, most Easters, I would fly back home. Some Christmases, some summers, my sisters would come to London with my mum or my dad. But in the interim, it was those people in that house, some people on my street, who looked out for me. Now, what I haven't said is that there are role models that are positive and there are role models that are negative. And I'm going to share some stories around the role models that I met in schools, the role models that I met on the streets, the role models I met in community places, and the role models I met socialising. And if anyone knows about the history of South London at that time, 1981 up until the 1990s, there were three riots on my manor in Brixton. I'm going to show my age now. Does anyone remember this? Three, two, one. So there's a TV show where a guy used to do that. But there was a shop called Rumbelows that did that. And in Rumbelows, you'd be sold a washing machine, a cooker, or a fridge. And you buy them for the price of one altogether. Now, the first riots, that shop got decimated, absolutely decimated. And a number of people I knew were involved in those riots. And some of those people were role models. Some of those people, and growing up, you had to be, where we grew up, part of a gang. It was simple. You couldn't walk the streets unless you were part of a gang. And some gangs were just a group of boys walking around and girls. Some gangs were a group of boys and girls walking around doing not so good stuff. But you had to be part of it. But what some of those gang members did was work out, actually, Bayer's quite smart, isn't he? He might be destined to good places. If you think about what Sophia said in terms of her presentation and what my dad and my mum instilled on me, was education, education, education. I had lofty dreams, lofty aspirations. But if I didn't follow certain role models or if certain role models who chose me didn't say, ah, now nah, you're not coming out with us tonight, or no, you're not coming out with us to the Brixton riots, or no, you're not going to fence the stuff that we've got, or no, we're not going to sell you the stuff that we've got, I might not be here today. It's a simple fact. Some of my friends are still inside since that time. Some of my friends are dead since that time. Some of the role models I had are obviously out on the streets doing what they're doing. But what I'm trying to say to you is that often in life as you're growing up, you meet people and subconsciously or consciously, they take you under your wing. Subconsciously or consciously, they try to teach you the right path. Subconsciously or unconsciously, they act as your role model. Growing up, you've all probably said, who's your role model? People have asked you, who's your role model? So you pluck out of the air some celebrity, some teacher, someone. But if you think deeper about it and ask yourself, when you were growing up, when you were doing your thing, who did you look at? Who did you aspire to? And who did you look at and who did you not aspire to? And sometimes those journeys will shift. Sometimes those journeys are dependent on the peaks and troughs and the social, economical, political climate that you're in. Again, I refer to Sophie's presentation, which was amazing, because there's so many similar points. Talk about my education. Born and bred in South London, my father came over, was a Christian, devout Christian, put us into Catholic schools. I went to predominantly white male Catholic schools. I was the only black person in my primary school. 
I was one of three black persons in my secondary school, so I was surrounded by white young men. Tough from boy coming from Brixton. I used to get a bus from Brixton, I don't know if you know geographically, from Brixton to Battersea, meant going through Clapham, Battersea, and being at school. But it also meant that I was meeting different people who had different aspirations and different thoughts about what they wanted to do and how they wanted to do it. So the three black guys in my year in my school, we were called the three degrees. I wonder why, because we were three black guys, but hey, that's another story. But each one of us can sit down now and talk about how we acted as role models to each other, how role models acted for us in terms of our dreams and our aspirations and what we wanted to do and how we want to achieve things. Don't get me wrong, I was not the best kid in the world. I did some dodgy stuff. I got involved in some dodgy stuff with some dodgy people. But eventually, those same dodgy individuals would say, that's your limit, mate. You're not destined for this path. You're a clever person. You go to school. You're educated. That's not for you. And you listen to that, hopefully. So in those school environments that I was in, there were some good and some bad influences. There were some good and some bad role models. Teachers, classic example of role models. They look at a person and they think to themselves, okay, we're gonna teach you, yeah, that's my job. But actually I might help shape and mold you because you might need it or they might think they see something in you that will take you to that next level. That's why I go back to my phrase, you don't often pick your role models, they choose you. If you think about some of the, for me, some of the working environment or education environments that I was in, when I left school, having failed my A-levels the first time, I went to my local pub, the Landor, and I told the landlady, gosh, I've got, I've got two U's and a C. She laughed and said, well, at least you were given the opportunity to do it and now you're going to be given the opportunity to do it again. And I did. I did pretty successfully. I was talking to some of you outside in a bar talking about my educational journey has been borne out by people who took an extra look at what I was trying to do. So one individual, Professor Danny Mokanyani, I was at Middlesex Polytechnic and he said, mm, I'm not sure why you're here. Why didn't you try a red brick? What was a red brick? I didn't know. I just thought you had to go to secondary third tertiary education, Polytechnic. He said, no, you're, you should go to Redbrook to study your law. And I did. He put himself out to say to me, actually, Bayo, there are some things about you that are different to others, or more importantly, there are things that you want to do that you don't know about. I'll help you shape that. Very important. Because shaping in your life is, is one of the key aspects of your development and your growth. And you as an individual, or we as individuals, can't necessarily do that on our own. We need to be inspired, we need to engage, and we need to be part and parcel of people who want to help. But that journey doesn't necessarily happen only by those who want to help, it can also happen by those who don't want to help. And then you try to work out what is good and not good for you. So just recap, home alone, Influences within the house, influences on the street, influences in terms of the communities I grew up with. People took time out to look for me positively. People took time out to look for me negatively and then for me to make a choice. As my dad used to say, diversity is a given, inclusion is a choice. And where I wanted to be included or who I wanted to be included in my life was always gonna be down to my choices. So what then happened after education? How did I survive between 11 and, what was it, 16, before my mother and her, my two sisters came back? Well, I think it put it down to how I was making those choices based on the role models that surrounded me, the role models that took time out to help shape me, the role models that took time out to show me a better way, the role models that took time out to say, this is good, this is not so good, what's your journey, what's your path? And it happened in the workplace as well. After graduating, finding that first job, not getting a job that I wanted to be, unlike Sophia who's a successful lawyer, I wanted to be a lawyer, I didn't become a lawyer. 
I was too raw. I didn't have the airs and graces of being a lawyer. Such is life, move on. So I went into housing, social housing, 30 years of social housing. But along the line, along the way, I came across individuals who I looked at and thought, they're not failures, they're not mistakes. They haven't got what they've got, or wanted, shall I say, but they've got what they want. What that means is, on your journey in life, you're going to come through peaks and troughs, never smooth. But it's the role models that choose you that can help you navigate those peaks and troughs, that can help you navigate the rough and the smooth. And I've been so fortunate to realize that now. Undertaking this TEDx talk, undertaking reviewing what my life was between 11 and 18 or 16 on my jacks has been cathartic has opened up my mind to what was I doing, let's say on a Thursday evening at six o'clock with no mummy and daddy to hold me, comfort me, cry with or scold me. Who was looking out for me? How were they looking out for me? And that's been a very powerful part of my journey. Because without the role models in my life, particularly the good ones, dare I say I'd have been as successful as I am today. And then, in terms of measuring your success, you're only going to compare it to some role models, aren't you? And so think about the role models you choose. And you are all role models. So think about the people you choose to be a role model to and how you choose to be a role model to them. Because as I said, role modeling and I deliberately didn't start with asking you the question, what is a role model? Role modeling is a choice. Role modeling is something that we do sometimes knowingly and unknowingly to our kids, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our foe. And for me, those that chose me put me in good stead so that what I do in my day job, be a coach, be a mentor, be a lecturer, I hopefully am putting across some positive aspects of being a role model. But I'm human. I'm going to come here next Saturday and get totally smashed. But I wouldn't tell everybody that, because that's not a positive role model. So, you don't pick your role models, or you can do if you're in a formative role modeling environment, but they often pick you. And as role models, and we all are in this room, think about how and what it is you can do to be a role model to your siblings, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your colleagues, and often to your foe, too. Thank you. <laughs>